my name is Jennifer Kovetsky. I am the coordinator of the writing, undergraduate writing support program, which is at the ARC, the Academic Resource Center. A um, couple quick things before I get started. So we, my office works kind of in partnership with Amber's office, um, and we provide writing support for the various written components of your application, right? So we're not able to tell you, like, are you a competitive applicant? Because we don't see your grades, <laughs> right? Um, or putting the whole application packet together, that's Amber and Charlie. Um, there is one thing that does kind of uh, make a difference between our offices. So my office is not able to support alumni. We can support only currently enrolled UCR undergraduates. Now, you don't have to be for summer, you don't have to be in summer classes, right? If you're in spring and then in fall, that's fine. You can still work with us over the summer, which we can't work with people who've graduated. Amber's office is different. They're funded differently and they are able to work with alumni. So if you are an alumni, and even if you're not, you should definitely use HPAC, but um, definitely wanna make sure that people kind of understand the difference. And to make an appointment with us, you would go to the ARCS website, which is arc.ucr.edu, um, and you can make an appointment through there. Uh, that, yeah, so do you wanna introduce yourself, Amber? Yeah, thank you. So I'm Amber Nicholson. I'm the Assistant Director of the Health Professions Advising Center. Um, as Jennifer already mentioned, HPAC does serve current students as well as alumni. So if you are getting ready to graduate, or I should say have just graduated or, or getting ready to graduate and um, are looking for some help with your personal statement, you might want to prioritize working with the staff at the ARC, particularly if you're having questions or concerns about um, how to craft your story, uh, sentence structure, grammar, syntax, spelling. Jennifer and her staff really support the writing process where Charlie and myself and our staff in HPAC, we're more familiar with content, um, the process, the logistics of submitting an application. And so you might very well find yourself in a situation where you would benefit from um, the advice of both offices. So wanted to give that um, housekeeping information, but we are going to spend the next 90 minutes or so discussing all of the written narrative sections of your application. Um, primarily, that is going to focus on your personal statement. But there is also a disadvantage statement, extracurricular activities, um, short essays. So we are going to approach all of the written sections of the application in this presentation. And so Jen is going to start us off. All right, so at its most basic, the personal statement, um, and really all of the application sections, but especially the personal statement, is a coherent narrative about who you are as a person and as a future health professional, right? And of who are you, why are you doing this? Um, and this is to help give the reviewers some sort of sense of you beyond your GPA and test scores. Yes, those are absolutely important, but you are more than your GPA. Um, and really what these are going to do is they're going to paint a picture of kind of your academic and career trajectory. Where have you been? Where are you now? Where are you going? Right? And you want that to kind of, not everything about who you are is relevant to why you want to be a health profession or go into your particular health profession. So you do kind of like want this trajectory to make sense. Um, and generally that kind of chronological order is the way most personal statements are written. Um, don't feel like you have to write it out of order or do something weird and creative. You're not, trust me, they're not going to give you points for sophisticated narrative structure. Um, you guys are going to be doctors, not creative writers. Um, that said, every so often somebody has a story that's actually better told slightly out of order. If that's, if that's you and you feel like that works better for you, that's fine. It's just a little harder to do it that way. But um, yeah, so you can definitely use the basic structure, but don't feel like you have to. This also gives us some sense of what you've been involved in outside the, con the classroom, right? What else have you done to kind of, uh, Amber uses this phrase that I really like, explore and confirm your interest. Um, another analogy she uses, it's like dating, right? You gotta, how do we know that this is the one you wanna marry? You gotta like try some things out. Um, and this can also give some context about your life circumstances, where you are, kind of, and how that affects you. So in my case, uh, my parents are both scientists. Um, I have a degree in literature, but I actually specialize in science fiction, right? So the fact that I grew up with science um, eventually influenced kind of the field I went into. 
Um, however, the fact that I have three cats, less important to that story, so that would not go in. Um, it can also be helpful to think of this as your personal statement is really trying to convince the readers that you're a good investment, right? And they are investing time and energy and money into you. And this can be useful, especially, it's weird to talk about yourself like it is. Um, and so kind of a mental trick you can use is if you're not talking about yourself, you're telling the reader about an exciting investment opportunity that just happens to be very similar to you. And that can kind of help. But that kind of helps also guide the kinds of things you want to put in here. What have you done to be prepared to be successful at medical school or at dental school, right? You didn't just wake up this morning and be like, teeth, that sounds like fun. Let's go to dental school, right? What have you done to prepare to do well in that circumstance? So this may seem obvious, but you'd be surprised. So carefully read the prompt and the application instructions. Um, and Amber and I are actually gonna show you some of the other professional school prompts because like the one for MD is very not helpful. So some of the other ones are clearer, but it's really important to read the prompts, um, really clear on what they want in the different sections because you have, to, you have to be sure you're answering the question that's being asked. I know that seems obvious, but I actually um, worked with a student once. They brought this essay in. It was a lovely essay, not about why they wanted to be a doctor, and that's what they were applying for, right? So especially secondary applications where they're asking you very specific things, you wanna make sure you're actually answering that question, right? And if sometimes these questions are not phrased well, so that's one of those times to use your resources, use HPAC, use my office to try to figure out sometimes what the question is actually asking, but very sure you're actually answering it um, and not answering what you want it to be. So that will move us into uh, briefly reviewing the specific prompts and character counts for each application. Um, on our presentation today, we have pre-med and pre-dental students, so I'll spend more time on those, but I will briefly run through the other major application prompts as well. So for students interested in applying at MD schools, the application is called AMCAS, the American Medical Centralized Application Service, and their prompt, as Jennifer just mentioned, is very vague and in some ways unhelpful. So use the space provided to explain why you're interested or why have you selected a field in medicine? Basically, why medicine? And, and that's a very big question. It can be approached in a variety or an unlimited amount of ways, which is why sometimes personal statement writing could feel so cumbersome, because how do you really break down on this question? And, and that's what we're gonna spend a lot of time on today. You have 5,300 characters, including spaces to answer this question which um, most people are used to word counts. Um, these applications do operate based on character count specifically. So that number of 5,300 characters is about a page and a half single spaced. For osteopathic medicine or DO medicine, their application is ACOMIS. And they don't have a required prompt that you must answer, but they do encourage you to provide your motivation for applying to the field of osteopathic medicine as your personal statement. So similar to why medicine, just more specifically why osteopathic medicine. So most students who are going to be applying to both MD and DO programs simultaneously will use a very similar version of their personal statements. Um, because the question is very similar. They just might add additional language to their osteopathic personal statement that specifically addresses why osteopathic medicine is the right form of medicine for them to practice. And their uh, character count, including spaces, is the same. It's 5,300 characters, including spaces, so about a page and a half single spaced. For pre-PA students, this prompt is basically the same. Why do you want to be a physician assistant? And they have 5,000 characters, including spaces. For our pre-dental students, it's both a DDS or a DMD. So two different degrees can lead to the same licensure for dentistry. Their application is ADSAS. Um, and the question that they have to answer is, again, why dentistry? So why do you want to pursue a career in dentistry? And it's 4,500 characters, including spaces, which is just about a page single spaced. It's a page in, in like a sentence or two onto the next page. 
And we're going to see that 4,500 characters, including spaces, is essentially the standard moving forward with the rest of these applications. So for PT, um, I'll be honest that this is the application that I have seen change throughout the years. Um, for the eight years or so that I've been doing pre-health advising, I haven't seen a change to the MD, DO, or dental applications, but I have seen a change to the prompt for physical therapy pretty regularly over the last few years. This is what the prompt was for last year. Um, since the application hasn't opened yet for this upcoming year, I can't say what it will be for this year, um, but this is the prompt as it was for last year. And it, again, it's 4,500 characters, including spaces. Moving on into some of the other applications, students are gonna start to see a much more um, specific question being asked for their personal statement. So maybe why have a student selected a career in occupational therapy, how that degree may relate to their immediate and long-term professional goals, and maybe describe how your personal education and professional background will help you achieve those goals. So a much more specific question, essentially asking you, you know, how did this interest start? What have you done to explore and confirm your interest? And what are those long-term goals or those outcomes? So kind of that three-part process, you're going to hear Jen and I refer to that multiple times throughout this presentation. Similarly for optometry, very similar. Um, what was your decision? Like, why are you pursuing a career in optometry? What is that preparation for the profession, your aptitude, your motivation? Um, and what is your future career goals? So again, how did this interest start? How have you prepared? You know, how have you explored and confirmed? And what are your career goals and objectives? Um, pharmacy is exactly the same as the occupational therapy. Why have you selected this career? How does it relate to your immediate and long-term goals? And what kind of preparation do you have to help you achieve those goals? And again, 4,500 characters, including spaces. That process pretty much follows for the rest of the CAS applications for health professions programs. And so this is a format that Jen and I have put together to help you put a little bit more um, concrete language to a question like why? Why medicine? Why dentistry? Why PA? Those are very big questions. And so thinking about the question languaged in this format might help you approach your personal statement and, and other levels of your writing in a more detailed way. So thinking about this essay is how did that interest develop, right? Briefly discuss the development of your interest in X profession. How did this all start? What was the spark that lit this match? Then in the body paragraphs, you're going to go on to discuss the activities and experiences that have contributed to your preparation for the program. Again, so that exploring and confirming language. And then in your conclusion paragraph, you might discuss what your career goals and objectives might be in a very brief and um, general way. So that three-part uh, format is what we recommend following to help make this process of answering such a big question of why a little bit more attainable. All right, so now that we've kind of talked about what the general requirements are, it's time to get started. So your personal statement can draw on lots of things, right? And so it's a good idea to just to start thinking of all the things that you've done that have influenced you, especially for um, the MD application because you guys have to write a lot of stuff. So you might wanna think about your personal history, your family background, volunteer experiences, clinical experiences, and these can be good and bad experiences, right? Sometimes bad experiences are why we do something. Because the personal statement 5,300 characters is room for two, maybe three body paragraphs. Um, so we tend to end up with mainly your clinical experiences. Often things like research ends up in your most meaningfuls, uh, which the MDs have. I don't think the dentals have most meaningfuls. Um, or if you've been an SI, we'll pull that out, put that in the most meaningful. But these are generally going to be ex paragraphs, examples about you doing the thing you're, or volunteering in a medical capacity or shadowing a dentist, right? Making sure you kind of know what you're getting into. 
Um, but you do want to make this comprehensive list because for all of you, you have to do activity descriptions. You have to do um, uh, your secondaries. So make a list of all of your extracurricular activities because you're going to want all of them. Generally, these are only from college or on um, unless so high school, yes, high school is important, but now that you're in college, high school doesn't really matter. The exception is if you were an Eagle Scout or a Gold Star, which is the Girl Scout equivalent of an Eagle Scout, right? A very big high school accomplishment might go on here, but generally speaking, um, college on. And for the extracurricular activities, um, it, those do not need to all be medical, right? Those can be everything, right? Maybe you play intramural sports. Maybe you teach Sunday school. Maybe you belonged to a club. Um, when I was in college, I belonged to a sword fighting club, and I'm an English major, so it doesn't matter, right? For the extracurriculars, everything kind of goes in there. But it's very useful to just kind of come up with a list of everything you've got, because that then gives you something to draw on. Okay, so Often where we start is how did you initially kind of become interested in this field, right? Where did this interest start? Now, it's possible you have a moment where the heavens opened up and the angels sang hallelujah and you knew you wanted to be a doctor. But honestly, most of us don't. If you do, great, it'll be much easier to write this. But most people do not have that. We kind of found our way here kind of through a series of events, right? But usually looking back, you can kind of see, oh, this is kind of when I started on this path. This is when I got interested in this particular field, right? Um, Amber always says, what was the spark that lit your match, right? Like, let's, let's get started. And then what have you done kind of to explore that interest in, you know, learn more about that this is what you want to do? Um, essentially, have you explored and confirmed your interests? Um, and then kind of where are you going? We want this to make sense, right? If you write me a lovely essay about you want to revolutionize healthcare policy in this, um, in this country, great. I don't know why you need to be a doctor to do that though, right? You might want to take a different path. So we do want whatever you're doing to make sense in your long-term goal. Um, you might also talk about any unusual obstacles you've had to overcome. This often ends up in the disadvantage statement, but sometimes it ends up in the personal statement. Um, but really kind of what we're looking for is a series of kind of, this is how I figured out I wanted to be a doctor or a dentist, right? This is how I got to here where the next logical step is this. Um, do you want to add anything, Amber? Um, I guess the only thing I would add is that <clears throat> the, how do I say this? You won't be able to include your whole life. Um, whether that's 22 years of life, 25 years of life, 30 years of life, however old you are, um, you're not going to be able to include every single detail from your pathway of all 22, 23 years of your life into 5,300 characters, including spaces. So these brainstorming questions are for you to kind of help flush out maybe some themes and trends in your experiences or your motivations or your aptitude. And then when you can I kind of identify like, hey, you know, I keep coming around to this idea of education and um, a lot of what physicians do is maybe health education, coaching patients on lifestyle changes, diet, nutrition, um, exercise, things like that. If that's a main theme for you that keeps coming up in this brainstorming writing, then perhaps that's going to be the direction in which you think about crafting your personal statement because you're not going to be able to include every single reason that you're interested in medicine or dentistry or pharmacy into this essay. You have to really think about maybe what is your most important reason or your most important two or three reasons and that will end up becoming the narrative that makes up your personal statement because all 25 reasons of why you want to be a pharmacist aren't going to be able to fit into one page single space. The other thing I can add to this is for students that might be looking at applying to post back programs. So some students attending this presentation are getting ready to apply directly to medical school or PA school or optometry school. Some are getting ready to apply to uh, 
post-bac programs to either complete pre-med coursework or to improve their GPA so that they're more competitive applicants. So if you do have um, kind of gaps or discrepancies in your academic record, if you have some GPA or standardized exam issues, most likely you're going to be applying to some programs where you're going to have the opportunity to rectify those issues prior to applying to medical school or dental school or pharmacy school. And so what I mean by that is there isn't really anything that you're going to be able to write in your personal statement that could justify a major gap or discrepancy in your academic record. Um, and so if there is a major academic issue that you have, you're definitely going to want to rectify that prior to applying to a professional program. All right, so I'm an English person. So I, your personal statement is a story, right? That's the story of how you got here. So we do need a clear kind of beginning, middle, and end, right? Like narrative arc here. Um, narrates kind of how and why you became interested in this. Um, and this is gonna be something you're gonna hear a lot. There's, there's lots of reasons why people want to go into these fields, but there's a couple of things you can't say, right? The first is you can't say, because I wanna help people, because that's great. You should act, not actively hate people, um, especially if you want to work with them. Um, there's lots of professions that don't work with people, right? And they're perfectly good professions. So what you want to think about is why is helping people important to you? And why is medicine the best way to help you? Why is there people, why is dental the best way to help people? Um, Amber and I help people, right? And generally speaking, nobody bleeds on us in the course of our day, right? So like, why do you want to go do this? Um, the other thing you can't say is, I like math and science. Great, you should like math and science. I like math and science. Um, my parents are scientists. I think science is really cool. Uh, doing science bores me to tears. Liking math and science, though, clearly doesn't get you a medical degree because I don't have one, right? So those are kind of like fundamental characteristics. Um, and again, why is math and science why is your interest in math and science propelling you in this particular direction, right? My interest in it actually kind of propelled me to my current job where I work with science folks to talk about their science, right? I get to read about cool science and I don't actually have to sit in a lab and do science. Um, and it can be hard to think about why you're interested in something because the real reason is because you find it inherently interesting. Um, so I have a PhD in English. I like reading books. I love reading books, I got a degree in it. Um, but when I really think about it, the reason I like books is I love meeting new people because I find people in their stories endlessly fascinating. Um, and books are a way for me to meet new people from all over the world from different places and times, right? I'm not lying, that's true to me. That's a reason I like books. And there's other reasons people like reading. So one of the things you're thinking about here is kind of, what is my, my reason behind my reason, right? What is my real reason, not just because I like it? And often the way we kind of get at that is showing you how you're kind of going through, like, oh, I had this experience and helped me, re I realized I liked this particular part of this experience. So I pursued that a little bit more and that's how I've decided I wanna be a dentist, right? So kind of that growing with. All right, next slide. So the introduction. The introduction is often the most important paragraph. So what that means though is not like, oh God, my introduction has to be perfect the first time I write it. What that means is you're gonna revise it a lot, right? Give yourself permission to write a bad introduction, especially at first, right? Um, you're just gonna, the, because the intro does kind of set the tone, um, but we that's something we work on a lot. Generally, the intro is um, often it's a personal story, an anecdote. There is your uh, fancy vocab word of the day. So an anecdote is a brief story that kind of maybe narrates how you got interested in this um, profession, right? Um, it could be a brief recap of your background. It could be a particular encounter with a health professional, right? Just kind of where did you start? Um, that's probably the one we see most often. We also want some sense of who, like, where is this essay going, right? In the first paragraph, I shouldn't be wondering, huh, I wonder if this person wants to like go be a preschool teacher, right? Some sense that this is going towards medicine, 
going towards dental, right? A um, couple things you want to avoid. You want to avoid really cliched, boring opening lines like, ever since I was five, I've always wanted to be. You have not always wanted to be anything. When you were a baby, you didn't know you had feet. You could have possibly known you wanted to be a doctor. Um, allow me to introduce myself. My name is, they know, it's in the application. You don't need to tell them. Uh, the question asked me to discuss, again, they know, they wrote it. Um, that said, if rephrasing the question helps you get started, great. Do that and we just delete that before you submit it, right? But you don't want to leave that in because they know what the answer, they know what the question is. Um, the other thing you want to avoid is that really kind of dramatic opening hook that they told you guys to use um, when you were doing the UC Common App, right? That's probably the last time you guys had to write one of these essays and they tell you to have that attention grabbing first sentence. And don't do that, it's weird. Um, some people can pull that off, uh, more power to them, right? It's like you go to a party and your friend can dance on a table with a lampshade on their head and everybody thinks they're great and we do it and it is not great. So don't push yourself to do that, right? You could just kind of be normal. So we don't have to have something like, I could hear the bone breaking across the courtyard. Like, that's weird. Um, so you can just kind of have a normal kind of, you know, when I was six, I went to the doctor, and these, this is what happened that helped get me started on this path, right? Just be normal. Don't feel like you have to have one of those crazy sentences. Okay, so Amber and I like to joke that, so you can go on the internet and you can see examples, 10 best essays that Harvard Med School got. Um, all these great kind of, you know, you can buy books that say that. We wish there was a book called Essays That Got the Job Done, right? Essays that succeeded in getting this person into their school. Because realistically, more than 10 people got into Harvard Medical School. And Honestly, those aren't even the essays that they used to get in. They've been, especially if they're published somewhere, they've been through another round of editing, right? Um, nobody writes like that. So we wish there were like kind of much more like essays that worked. So we deliberately chose kind of, these are not the most exciting ones we've ever seen. They're not the most revolutionary ones we've ever seen, but they worked, right? These people got into the school they were applying to, right? Um, and we, so like, yeah, so these are like essays that worked. So here is an introduction that somebody used. So growing up in this particular country, oral health care was considered luxury rather than a necessity. Most people expected teeth to degrade as they aged. Once I moved to the U.S., I realized that visiting the dentist was critical to maintaining proper overall health. Unfortunately, as immigrants, my family could not afford dental care until my father was able to maintain a stable job where dental insurance was a reasonable expense. When I was finally able to see my first dentist and later get braces and have emergency oral surgery, my interest in the field of dentistry began. So this intro is not going to set the world on fire, right? It's not going to want to pull a surprise. But I want to read the next paragraph, right? I want to see where this goes. And this is someone, okay, I see where this is going. And Amber, I think you have something you always want to add with this one. Perhaps. Um, I guess I could say to this that, um, well, two things. You're not applying to a writing-based discipline. As we've kind of indirectly mentioned, you are applying to a professional program, medical school, dental school, pharmacy school. So although you should be able to write at a college level, it should be error-free, it should be articulate and well-crafted, um, again, you're not applying to a creative writing program. You're not trying to win a Pulitzer Prize for what Jen said is sophisticated narrative structure. So instead of thinking about this as a personal statement, which it is, we also like to think about it as um, like a professional essay or a cover letter to a resume, thinking about how am I articulating my professional um, trajectory towards pharmacy, dentistry, medicine, um, and, and sometimes thinking about it more of a professional essay or a cover letter to a resume makes it a little bit easier to use that scary I word um, instead of we that we use a lot in science and research. But you're going to be using I a lot in your personal statement. And then when we couple the idea of personal and the word I, Sometimes students will want to write an entire essay about their life, their family structure, 
um, maybe their religion or their um, just personal experiences. And those types of things end up showing up in the introduction as it has here. But when we move on into the body paragraphs, we're going to start to see that this um, changes focus into much more of the professional experiences that the student has. But perhaps thinking of it as a professional essay and not a personal statement could help. Um, and then the other thing I could add is nobody's going to read your first sentence or your first paragraph and immediately want to get you on the phone, congratulate you for being the best writer that they've seen all application cycle and admit you on the spot. And I think that um, some blogs and forums and podcasts put that kind of pressure on personal statement writing as if your entire application hangs on the thread of your first sentence or your introductory sentence. Um, and that's not realistic. Your personal statement is a piece of a larger puzzle. Um, it is a piece of your application as a whole. It should be, again, well-written and articulate. Um, it should make a coherent point. It should not just say, I like science and I want to help people, therefore I want to be a pharmacist. It, it does need to go deeper than that. But at the same time, it's not going to be the thing that either gets you in or gets you rejected. It's a piece of a larger puzzle. I sometimes tell students, we could, we could make this be the most beautiful essay they've ever seen, but if, if you have a 1.9 GPA, they're not going to read it. Right. Right. The other thing, too, is that example is an example. It's not a template. Thank you right. for adding that. <laughs> you do not have to write it like that. Um, in fact, probably won't write it like that. Um, we deliberately picked that example because many people have similar experiences, and it's helpful to see how one approach. The reason I like writing is there's no right answers. So uh, that is one way to approach that. That is not the only way. There is no best way. But yeah, don't be like, I have to start that way. Um, and that's one of the reasons Amber and I was, were initially reluctant to put an example in because sometimes students see it and think it's a template. That's just one way to get started. Um, so for body paragraphs, we keep saying how did you explore and confirm your interests? That's really what we're doing, right? How, um, what clinical volunteering, you know, experiences have you had, right? I am a strong writer. I could probably write an essay for med school. They might notice I don't even know first aid, right? So you want to show, like, how have you done various things to be sure this is the right path for you? You also don't want to just say, I volunteered. Um, because, great. Um, so you want to explain why this thing is important, why this helped move you along on your path. So you had this experience, maybe you volunteered at the Riverside Free Clinic. How did that help you confirm that this was the right path for you? How did it help you figure out that medicine or dentistry was the way you wanted to make a contribution? Um, how did that experience um, help confirm that you even just wanted to work with people, right? Um, kind of how did this help you figure out, ah, yes, this is the right path for me. Um, you also want to use what we call generally specific examples, uh, which I know is not the most clear term. So, so you can't be so general that anybody could say it. If you're just like, I volunteered, like, okay, that's too general. But in these essays, 5,300 characters is really not that much. We generally don't have room for really specific stories. Like, I remember Mr. Smith, and it was a cold day in April. Like, that's lovely. The English major in me loves that. You don't have time for that. So what you kind of want to do is hit the middle point, right? So maybe what you were going to talk about with Mr. Smith was he didn't listen to the doctors. I bet you saw lots of patients who didn't listen to the doctors. So you can say, as a volunteer, I saw, you know, older patients who kind of really were reluctant to give up their autonomy to conform to what the doctor wanted. And here's what I learned from that experience, right? So it's still specific to you and your experience, but it's not like I remember Mr. Smith and his diabetes uh, because you just don't have time. So you kind of want to hit that middle, like, ah, uh, here's a common theme I saw among lots of patients, right? Chronic conditions and lack of access to healthy uh, food. That might be something you want to talk about. Um, patients who kind of didn't engage with the doctors or patients who did engage with the doctors, right? Maybe a doctor who was really good at working with patients who often don't listen. Um, 
right? Those kinds of things. So that's kind of what you're looking for with these generally specific examples. Yeah, they're like like takeaways or um, I guess like a summary when you think about my experience as a whole what are those themes and trends that kind of bubble up to the top? What were those things that I saw over and over and over again? And going back to the brainstorming, that's what can kind of help flush some of that out. And then I just wanted to very quickly point out again, the reason we keep saying you can't just say, I want to help people and I like math and science classes is because that would be true for every single person applying to a health professions program. That would be true for a pre-med, a pre-dent, a pre-farm, a pre-PT, a pre-PA. Every single one of the 120 health professions uses science in a way to help people. Um, and so those are kind of those common denominators. So thinking about um, kind of that, that second bullet point here, how do you want to help people? Like, how does helping people look to you? In what way do you want to help somebody? That's what we're trying to get at here. That's that next layer down is what is helping somebody look like? Because that could be oral health, but it could be education. It could also be law, lawyers. If you ever talk to a lawyer, one of the main reasons they're gonna say they went to law school is to help people, to help people navigate the criminal justice system. So it's, it's that how are we helping people that we're trying to help you all get to. Okay, all right, so here is a kind of, we, we Amber, really, uh, kind of condensed this, so, uh, but just to kind of give you an idea, again, of what a body paragraph might look like. So, as a volunteer at Kaiser Permanente Urgent Care Pharmacy, I experienced the true abilities of pharmacists in the real environment. I saw pharmacists as leaders in the community who build relationships with patients by being the most accessible healthcare professionals. Pharmacists were able to consult with patients in a professional manner while also maintaining interpersonal connections. I observed how pharmacists were able to manage high volumes while also delivering accurate and detailed responses to patient and physician questions. Most importantly, I learned that pharmacists are the bridge between many healthcare professions and the community as most treatments revolve around medications. Through my exposure to pharmacists as the drug experts, the variety of settings in which they can work, their roles as leaders in the community, and as collaborating members of the healthcare team has led me to confirm my interest in pursuing pharmacy as a profession. So a couple of things I wanna highlight here, um, again, not the most exciting paragraph, although arguably you do not want your pharmacist, future pharmacist to be exciting, um, <laughs> right? But we, there's a couple of things. One, this person is demonstrating they understand what pharmacists do. They understand the roles and the nature of the profession, right? Um, you see them kind of consult with patients, building those interpersonal collections, keeping being accurate while staying busy, like all of those things. You also, this is a problem sometimes with paragraphs about shadowing is because when you shadow, you don't do anything. You just literally stand there. So sometimes those paragraphs end up being about the person you're shadowing, which is lovely, but that person is not going to medical school. They already did. So this person is saying, I observed how they did these things, right? And then they bring us to the conclusion, because of what I observed, this is why I want to be a pharmacist, right? Because lots of times I read essays where people are like, I saw this stuff they'll stop with, as most treatments revolve around medications. And I'm like, and does that make you, like, that's true. The pharmacist reading this will be like, yeah, that's true. But it is not telling me why you want to be a pharmacist, right? So you do need to have that, I like to call it the so what. So this makes you want to be a pharmacist, um, why? Um, and I think originally this was two paragraphs, which is why that last sentence is a little wonky, um, because Amber and I changed it. Um, but yeah, just kind of giving you a sense of like what, what these paragraphs need to be doing. And this is generally specific too. It's not a specific incident. It's the kind of takeaway from the whole thing. And yes, this was a condensed um, at least two paragraphs, maybe three, but um, in a pharmacy essay, it's only one page. So this is probably two paragraphs that we condensed. All right, so the conclusion is a lot easier actually than you're probably thinking it is. So really what your conclusion is doing is where are you going, right? Where, what is life after your health profession school look like? So you want to avoid sweeping generalizations. I'm going to cure everyone. I will provide free health care to patients because realistically, no, you're not, right? Um, if one person can provide free health care, that's great. They should like, go into Congress. 
Um, I'm not even sure Bernie Sanders by himself can do it. Um, you're also not going to be able to fix everything, right, or cure everyone. Um, for example, I am extremely nearsighted because my eyes are the wrong shape. There is no cure. There's treatments, but no matter how hard my eye doctor tries, he can't fix it. It's just the way I am. Um, and sometimes, I mean, my eyes are not going to kill me, but sometimes patients have things that, like, they're not going to get better from. So you don't want to kind of be like, I'm going to fix everything. You also want to avoid um, being set on one type of medicine um, because you don't know what your residency is going to be, right? And this is one of those, like, you, you're supposed to, like, know that you don't know. Um, if you have friends who have gone into, like, they're pursuing a PhD or a master's in, like, biology or chemistry, they get very specific in their conclusion about what they want to do. You guys don't get to do that. Um, so, yeah, you just kind of generally medicine. I think dentists can be a little more specific, but you still don't want to be, like, I'm going to be the top oral surgeon in Western Massachusetts by the time I'm 30. Like, that's too specific. Don't do that. <laughs> yeah, and the reason, um, so dentists can be a little bit more specific because residency is optional for dentistry. So after your four years of dental school and you have your DDS or a DMD, you are uh, licensed to be a general dentist. And then about 20% of dentists will go on to specialize in ortho, endo, perio, whatever. Um, and so because that's more of an option, a student could include that in their conclusion. For medicine, everybody has to do a residency regardless. Even um, family medicine or primary care um, is an additional three or four years of residency. So um, residency is not optional. Specializing is not optional for medicine. Um, every physician has a specialty. Even family medicine or primary care is considered a specialty. And unfortunately, you have some control over that process, but largely you don't have a lot of control over that residency placement process. And so you want to be able to be kind of more flexible in your conclusion because you really don't know where you will end up with residency. And a lot of it is based on your USMLE step one scores and, and some other factors. So you want to follow kind of the, the next point that Jen's going to go into, particularly if you're pre-med. So I like to say what you do in your conclusion is you're going to give us kind of the, an overview of the kind of doctor you want to be, right? Are you leaning towards research? Are you leaning towards primary care? Are you interested in working with underserved communities, right? And this is going to kind of like, if all you've talked about is research in your essay and you're like underserved communities, that's not going to make any sense, right? But kind of generally the, the area. And same with um, characteristics, right? Maybe you want to be a health edge, like that's really interesting to use health education. Um, Maybe being culturally competent is really important. Maybe being an advocate for your patients is really important to you, right? So there's kind of just the general kind of doctor you want to be, um, not the specific, or dentist, not the specific, like, super, super specific. Um, and so part of that is these conclusions tend to be very, very short because you honestly don't have much to talk about um, because you can't talk about the specific school because you're going into a general application. Um, and you can't talk about a specialty, um, which you guys and the lawyers are the only ones who go into a central system and the lawyers get to talk about specialties. So these tend to be very short, just like generally speaking, this is the kind of doctor or dentist I foresee myself being, right? Um, and we have some, we actually have two examples. Um, so as a future optometrist, I'll have the ability to apply what I learned in the classroom to a clinical setting that goes beyond the exam room. I look forward to being able to apply my knowledge to address eye care disparities and create a precedent that will set the stage for a larger scale solution. This is only two sentences. One sentence looks weird. It has to be longer than one. But like, it can be, two sentences is very common. Um, and then we have the second one, which is a little longer, but it's still, I think it's three sentences. Witnessing my father's lifelong battles with chronic diseases has taught me the importance of well-being and the limitations severe health conditions can impose. Discovering my passion to similarly support individuals through challenging health conditions has been instrumental in my decision to pursue a career in medicine. As a physician, I will work with patients, communities, and healthcare professionals to improve healthcare and innovate medicine with the ultimate goal of serving humanity. 
right? So this person is able to get to the like, I wanna make these big picture changes, but I'm going to contribute because by yourself, you're not going to. The other thing to remember with the conclusion is at this point, you have either convinced them or you have not, right? Um, you know, in gymnastics, they do all those cool flips and turns in the air and then they just have to like stick the landing, right? They just have to not fall over. All your conclusion really needs to do is just not fall over. Like you just be normal for three more sentences, right? Because yep. um, yeah, the conclusion is often where the wheels come off the bus. You're like, fine, fine, oh no. Um, so I think Amber has some examples of like what not to do in your conclusion. Yeah, it's just where like the begging and the, the bargaining and the pleading and the name dropping can start to come in. Um, if you are applying to a program, ideally, logically, theoretically, you are a competitive applicant, so you don't really need to beg anybody for anything. What you're doing is demonstrating um, your interest and your ability and your aptitude in writing. So don't let the wheels come off the wagon here in the conclusion and just start kind of getting awkward and word vomity. And that's where having a reviewer can be helpful because um, a lot of times I would say what is very common for Jen and I both to do is like to delete the first thing you write and the last thing you write. That, that's probably some of the most common changes that I make in personal statements is there's almost like two introductory paragraphs. One is you could really tell the student is kind of trying to find their writing legs then they, they get to it in the second paragraph. And so we just delete the first one. It's like, this is where you kind of start. And then they make a solid conclusion, but they don't know if that's where they should stop. So they just kind of keep word vomiting after that. And we can just kind of delete the last couple sentences and say, you end here, you end on that, that strong note. Um, because you, I, I know nobody's ever going to enter an application cycle like completely confident that they're going to be admitted. There's always some, you know, what ifs and I want this to, to go well, obviously. But you also don't want to approach it as like, I'm so unsure of my application and I'm so unconfident that I'm coming off as somebody who's really begging for admission. Because if you're spending $4,000 to apply to medical school or dental school, you should be confident that you are a strong competitive applicant and that should show in your writing. So don't, so, don't start begging at the end. Yeah. And sometimes people think they're being humble, right? Oh, I would be so appreciative if you gave them this opportunity. The problem is that reads as lack of confidence, right? It reads as I'm not sure I'm ready for this. So like, I know why a lot of students do it and it's coming from a good place, but like, especially in these essays, you gotta at least pretend to be confident, <laughs> right? And you also don't wanna say things like, and in conclusion, my cats think I'd be great at this, or in conclusion, I wanna be a pharmacist because they have access to the best drugs. Like, don't say stuff like that, right? Just, just like be normal for like three sentences and then you can be done. <laughs> so that was personal statement. Um, we start with personal statement because that's probably the section you're most concerned about, and it's what probably brought you to this presentation today. But it's certainly not the only writing that you're gonna do in the application. And um, probably most importantly, it's actually not the section I want you to start with. So we do it first because we know that's what you guys came for, but I actually want you all to start with the what we call the work and activity section first. Um, or the resume section, however you want to think about this. This is where you're going to go through all of the different extracurriculars, um, jobs and conferences, um, clubs and orgs that you've done during college, as Jen mentioned earlier. Um, it's usually about 15 entries. Some of the applications, it's unlimited, but for medical school, it's 15 entries. Um, and you'll have between six and 700 characters, including spaces for each of the 15 entries that you put into your application. Um, again, characters is an odd way for some of us to think about length of writing. And so 700 characters is about a paragraph to give you some, some logical thought of how long that is. 
So essentially for every club or org or job or experience that you've had, you'll have about a paragraph to um, articulate some things about that experience. Medical schools, um, particularly the MD application, um, does have the most writing of all the applications. So in addition to that one paragraph that you get for each extracurricular experience, you will be able to denote three of your experiences as what we call the most meaningful. So these tend to be things that maybe you spent longer time doing or more time doing, or they were very profound and meaningful to you. Um, where you'll get an additional 1,325 characters on top of the 700 characters that you would have initially wrote. Um, so in total, your most meaningful experiences are about 2,000 characters, so that's about three paragraphs. So you would have three paragraphs for your each for your three most meaningful experiences, and then one paragraph each for each of the um, additional 12 or less experiences after that. Um, for the most meaningful experiences, although it is 2,000 characters in total, it is separated into two different boxes. So there's, um, and the, uh, the initial 700 characters is kind of in one box. And then when you click the button that says most meaningful experience, a separate box comes up where you'll enter those additional 1,325 characters. And I only bring that up just to point out that it's not necessarily 2,000 characters in one running essay. It is separated to like one paragraph where you'll have to end a thought, end a sentence, and then go into the next box where you'll have two more paragraphs where you'll kind of have to start a new thought and a new sentence. Um, can I add something about Please. the working activities? So a couple things. Often you guys don't realize you have 15. Um, sometimes people don't think, they think it has to all be medical. Um, we really mean anything, anything that you do, right? Maybe you go rock climbing on the weekends, that goes in. Um, and sometimes things like say you're a CNAS ambassador, so that, that's one, and you participated in CNAS Discovery Day, that's two, right? You don't have to put that all into one. Um, and when you're writing these, the kind of format we suggest you follow for the paragraphs is what the thing is, what you did, and what you learned, right? Outside of UCR, and even within UCR, I don't know what everything is that happens on this campus, right? So you do need to tell us something about, to tell the reader something about what the thing is. Now sometimes people over, correct on this one and I get a whole paragraph about the org and like no 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 right um Riverside Free Clinic it helps it's got the name uh is a community-based clinic that provides health care at low to no cost for community members right what the thing is and then what you did right what did you do as part of it did you attend meetings did you you know did you do various things and then kind of what you got out of it right Sometimes what you got out of it will be medically related, but don't feel like you have to push it, right? Like I have to come up with how this is medicine or dental related. Maybe you were a tutor and this helped you improve your ability to explain complex things. Um, it, maybe it gave you an opportunity to work with a wide variety of people, right? Maybe it helped you develop your leadership. Um, those are all perfectly good things that you could develop from an experience, right? So what the thing is, what you did, what you learned. Exactly, that's kind of the, the rhythm, the routine, the recipe that we would recommend. Um, that's not required. This again is, is our recommendation as advisors to make this process more approachable to students. Um, so you could attend different um, blogs or podcasts or forums and, and somebody else might give you a different recommendation. This has been successful way to approach this that Jen and I have seen over the years. So again, this is our recommendation on, on how to approach this. And we would do this in narrative format. Um, so paragraph format, uh, sentence, complete sentences, not bullet points. So in a resume, you would more likely um, kind of just bullet point the things that you did and the outcomes that you gained. But in this section, we would prefer it to be written more in um, a paragraph format, a narrative format. This 
is a section that is what I would consider much easier for students to write than um, a very big question like why medicine and, and how do you really break that down in a way that makes sense for you. That's gonna take quite a bit of time and quite a bit of drafts to get through. And if your writing is rusty um, or you're a science major and, and maybe you haven't written anything since freshman English or even during that time, you don't really feel like you had strong, strong writing skills, this is gonna be a much easier place to start because it's less philosophical and it's more factual. And I'm a scientist within my undergraduate education and generally our science-minded folks are more comfortable in fact. So really saying this is what the program is, these were the specific roles and responsibilities that I was um, charged with, and this is what I learned and gained or developed, and, and kind of doing that for each extracurricular experience is going to start to rebuild the writing skills that you might need to then go into a more complex essay like your personal statement. So I would really recommend that you start with this section first. And as Jen mentioned, this is going to be everything that you've done during college, um, cultural clubs, religious clubs, hobby clubs, social clubs, fraternities, sororities, honor societies, pre-med or pre-health clubs. Um, it could be hospital volunteering, shadowing, research, paid jobs, all kinds of paid jobs, even if you work at dining or housing or the ARC or for Uber or for Best Buy, um, it's gonna be all different types of um, experiences that you can put into your application. And uh, the last thing I'll say with this is when you think about what you learned, gained, or developed, try to be positive. Um, about what those things are. And um, I guess I mean that maybe particularly in research. Sometimes I see students that do research and they might write like, what I learned is that I didn't wanna do research and I didn't wanna get a PhD. And, and that may be true and I definitely appreciate your all's honesty in, in writing something like that. But maybe think about a more positive skill set that you learned through research. Like, did I learn how to be a better problem solver? Or did I learn how to be more analytical? Did I learn resiliency? Because a process of research is just um, constant <laughs> failure in, in some ways, like this didn't work and I had to do it again and again and again. Um, so yes, there can be the truth to like, I kind of learned I didn't want to do this or I learned that you know, some of these things might be inherently like really difficult or challenging or negative, but you still have the ability to potentially put a positive spin to that. Um, so that's gonna be the extracurricular section. Every single application has this um, high school stuff that could be applicable, as Jen mentioned earlier, could be Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, like if you were an Eagle Scout or a Gold Star, in addition to uh, if you did like an ROP program, a work opportunity program in high school where you obtained a medical license, maybe you became an EMT, a medical assistant, a dental assistant through like an, a high school ROP program, that would be something to include into this section as well. So every single thing that you've done during college um, in a cumulative way will be reported into this application. It's not a snapshot in time of what are you doing at the time that you apply. It's what have you done throughout your entire four years or five years or six years or 10 years, however long it's taken you to complete your degree and apply. Um, some things you did your freshman year and you learned what you needed to learn from them and you moved on into a new experience. So even though you no longer are actively engaged in that experience you were at some point in time and so it would still be included into your application and don't discount scholarships because that is also something you can put in the section um, and scholarships do not have helpful names so you do need to explain what those are right like i got the michigan merit scholarship does that tell you guys anything <laughs> right so I would need to, if I put that in, explain, like briefly, explain, like this is uh, all Michigan seniors who had a certain GPA got uh, $1,200 towards college, right? So um, 
and then I had to maintain a good GPA in college, right? But just saying, oh, I'm a chancellor's research fellow. What does that mean, right? Um, I'm on the dean's list. That, what is the dean's list, right? Um, so just kind of briefly saying, oh, the dean's list is awarded to, you know, to be on the dean's list, you have to have this GPA. Um, and then I was on the dean's list for three consecutive quarters and I'm now on the chancellor's list, right? But that varies a lot between schools. Um, so you want to, if you put something like that on, you want to make sure you say what it is, right? Unless it's even something like the National Merit Scholarship, which you might be able to get away with, not explaining, but pretty much everything else, nobody knows, right? I think the Michigan Merit Scholarship has been more valuable as an example than it was as a scholarship. <laughs> So that's the extracurricular section. So I want to move into one of the last pieces of writing, um, which in some applications they call a disadvantage statement. In some applications um, it's called a special life circumstances essay, which is, is probably a lot more appropriate title, a special life circumstances essay. Um, disadvantaged statement sort of has um, a negative connotation, but this essay definitely is not considered a negative aspect of your application. It's really just an opportunity for you to share maybe some challenges or hardships that you've been through in your life that wouldn't otherwise be disclosed in a different section of your application. Like it might not show up in your personal statement because it doesn't have anything to do with why you wanna be a physician or a dentist. Um, but it's definitely context to your life story and your life trajectory and kind of your lived experience. And so Jen and I don't love the term disadvantage statement, but that is what um, the medical school application calls it. The dental school application calls it a special life circumstances essay. For the MD application for AMCAST, you get 1,325 characters, including spaces for this essay, which is an incredibly short amount of space. It's about six sentences. Um, so most likely you'll use every single one of those characters if you're going to write this essay. The dental school application actually gives you an entire 4,500 characters including spaces to write this essay, which you wouldn't be required to use all of that space. So let's say you got your essay written in half the amount of space. That's totally fine. In the section, in this section of the application, if you have the ability to write it and will be writing it, um, we we encourage you to focus on generally circumstances that were prevalent in your life during your K through 12 years, which we consider to be your formative years. Um, that's not true for everybody. Some students that I meet with their lives are more challenging today than they were during their K through 12 years, and that could still be a reason to write this, this section of the application. But for most of the students that I meet with, they uh, indicate to me some challenges that occurred in elementary school or middle school, but per perhaps those challenges aren't as big today, or maybe they've been rectified today, and so the student doesn't necessarily feel that they should be writing this essay but they should. So we consider our formative years to be very important because as some of us may know in let's say middle school, that's a very difficult time in our formative process. And it is, is definitely a time where one person may kind of stay on that quote unquote straight and narrow and another person may end up in like the cornfields, you know, making some really bad choices. So what happened to you during those times is actually a, a pretty important um, phase in our life. We also encourage you to think about this again as a very factual um, essay. I know, the, again, the term disadvantage statement can be really uncomfortable. You may feel like you're indicating that in some way your parents didn't love you or care about you or support you, or maybe they were like bad people in some way. And that's definitely not how we, Jennifer and I, feel about this essay or an admissions committee feels about this essay. Um, they're really looking for you to kind of share some, some factual, tangible things that may have happened to you um, throughout your life. Like maybe you're a first generation American. Um, a first generation American would be somebody who 
was born in the United States, but their parents were not. If you yourself were not born in the United States, you would categorize yourself more as an immigrant to the U.S. So that could be information that would be helpful for the admissions committee to know if you are first gen or you're an immigrant. Um, maybe you're a first gen college student, um, and that usually we mean within the U.S. So um, are you the first in your family to pursue higher education within the United States? And the reason we use that um, differentiation is because the U.S. education system is very different than most of the rest of the world. So although your parents may have had higher education in their, their country of origin, one, it's likely that that education didn't transfer um, with them when you all uh, decided to immigrate to the U.S. So I have a lot of students where their parents have professional careers in you know, X country, they were a lawyer or an engineer or a physician, but then upon coming to the U.S. and that degree not transferring, um, maybe they're working at a nail salon, a gas station, a nurse, um, perhaps they've had to change their career. And secondarily, again, the U.S. education system being very different, if your parents have more of a lens of what education is in this other country, in the Philippines or in India or Vietnam, it's not going to be translatable to what the U.S. education system is. And unfortunately, that can create a little bit of tension between a student and a parent because they're thinking, you know, what is this undergraduate degree for? Why are you taking a gap year, you know, in, Europe, it's done this way, you would already kind of be in medical school at 22, 23. You would be almost finishing medical school at that age if you were um, attending school in a country that used more of the European model. So there's kind of some, some tension that can be created through that, um, which is not bad, but it, maybe it made your experience a little bit more challenging than somebody who didn't have to um, kind of constantly be explaining why things are the way they are within your college experience. Um, your first language might not have been English, so that, that can be very helpful to share if um, your first language or your primary language spoken at home is not English. That will make you a better care provider, 100%. Being bilingual or multilingual is going to help you professionally, personally, academically. It's very helpful but in your home life, it may be challenging that you're constantly um, uh, interpreting or uh, relaying information between like your teacher and your parent, or maybe you have to go to doctor's appointments with your parent to help translate for um, the physician or the care provider. That's not necessarily bad, but it's not really ideal, right? It, it put you in a position where you had to take maybe a, a higher level kind of role within the family structure because you had to go everywhere with mom. You had to go to the DMV and the grocery store and the doctor's appointments so that you could make sure um, that um, language wasn't a strong barrier. So again, it's, it's not bad, but it might not be as an ideal way for a child to spend their childhood. Perhaps your parents' education um, occupation or income may be pertinent to include here if your parent has the equivalent of a middle school education or a high school education and grew up in a farming community and is working in what we call a blue collar job or has been in and out of employment, has struggled with keeping um, a consistent income, um, or you own your own business, which has made health insurance an unreasonable expense. And so maybe you didn't have health insurance because your parents own a furniture business. Um, those would be things to share with an admissions committee to put context to what your life story might look like. And I, Perhaps you grew up in a single parent household, um, not necessarily meaning like, hey, the DA turned 18, my parents got divorced which definitely does suck because that was part of my lived experience. That's not necessarily like the best thing. Um, but what we mean here is like for a majority of your life, you are on a single parent household or a single parent income. Maybe you're not really sure who one of your parents is. 
maybe one of your parents is incarcerated or hasn't been a part of your life, that would be helpful information to share. Um, maybe you grew up in communal living, so perhaps there's many families uh, living in the same household, grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins. Um, I've had one student who lived um, in communal living. She had 17 members of her family living in a two bedroom, one bathroom house. Um, she honestly had no idea that that wasn't a common or ideal way to grow up until college, until she started having an opportunity to live outside of that family home. Um, for her, that was just normal. It wasn't bad, it was just normal. So that might be something to share. Um, I've had students that grew up in hoarding households. That might be something to share. If you grew up in like San Bernardino or an area that might not be considered affluent or safe or has you know drugs or gangs or educational disparities, that could be important to share. Um, if you've been required to hold a job to help pay for college and family expenses, that would be helpful to share. And then I have et cetera. So et cetera is where I think we get into things that students feel they have to be able to say in order to write this essay. Like they have to be able to say, I grew up homeless or in an abusive environment or I'm ex-military or I have children of my own. Um, and, and those things would absolutely be applicable to a special life circumstances essay. But all of the things that I just mentioned and in some context that Jen will probably add here as well are still things that would be applicable to this type of essay. And they're things that almost all of my students are going to say at least half of this applies to me. And so that would be an indicator that it would be helpful for your application to share those details with the admissions committee. Um, I'll take a breath there and let Jen add some context to this and there's a couple chat questions I'll read. Okay, so a couple of things. Um, so I've had some students say, yes, I was raised by a single mom, but we always had food on the table and a roof over our head. And that's, that's great, right? I'm glad that you had that, but that's not ideal, right? What if your mom got sick? Um, you didn't have another parent to pick up the slack. Um, what if your mom had to work two jobs to put food on the table and keep a roof over your head? Then, you know, that you maybe have, she wasn't able to help you with your homework, right? Um, so this doesn't mean your parents are a disadvantage. Um, or, well, actually, okay. So one, it's not a competition. Don't be like, I've had some students go, well, it's not like I'm a refugee. And I'm like, it's not, it's not the oppression Olympics. The other thing to remember is this doesn't mean your parents didn't love you and didn't want you to be successful. So my, but it does mean things were harder than they needed to be. So my parents actually both have master's degrees. So when I went to college, um, my parents knew ahead of time that books were going to be really expensive. So they set aside extra money for when we went to the bookstore to buy my college textbooks. According to my mother, she didn't know how much, how much more they expensive they'd gotten. Um, but we get there, I see it costs like $200 for a calculus book, and my mom's like, yeah, don't worry, we know. I didn't have to worry about it, right? Even though my folks didn't have a lot of money, they knew to anticipate that expense, so they were able to kind of set aside money. This doesn't mean maybe your family, you all went to the bookstore and were like, $200 for a calculus book. That doesn't mean your family didn't figure out a way to get you that calculus book. It just means like, I, it was easier for me, right? Um, and so that's one of the reasons we encourage you guys to talk about that. That was an extra stress that you kind of had to go through that in an ideal world you wouldn't have. Um, also, if you go on the internet, you'll see people say like, oh, it has to be a real disadvantage to go in here. Yes, it does have to be a real disadvantage to go in there. But they mean things like a not real disadvantage would be when UCR was doing its big first gen push and they were having, they were highlighting staff and faculty and students who were first generation college students. Every time I went to anything, they're like, are you first gen? Do you want a sticker? And I had to say, no, I, I'm not first gen. And like, if I wrote this about like, it was so hard that everybody else got recognized and got stickers and I didn't, that's not a real disadvantage, <laughs> right? Um, but being first gen having, so like, you don't wanna be like, oh, it was so hard that I didn't get a sticker. 
Um, but that's what you want to avoid. But for many of you, coming to this country is not easy, right? Having parents that don't speak the language of the country is not easy. Um, and so it doesn't mean your parents don't love you. It doesn't mean things didn't work out, but it is worth bringing up here uh, because it gives extra context for who you are and where you come from. And a lot of this, the other reason you want to talk about this stuff, it'll make you a better health practitioner, right? Um, even if you work with somebody who uh, maybe you speak uh, English and Spanish and you're working with somebody who doesn't speak either of those languages, you have some sense, let's say they speak Mandarin, you have some sense of kind of the challenge and the, the concern and the fear that that patient is facing because you've been there or your parents have been there, right? So it is definitely worth bringing up. The other couple of things I want to bring up quickly is uh, because we're in Southern California, normally, and you guys are all at UCR, that has given you a skewed perspective of diversity um, at many universities. So my husband is from a small town in Michigan. He did not meet an Asian person until college. Not because he was trying to avoid Asian people, but because there weren't any in his small town. Um, so yes, you may be like, well here, there's lots of Asian Americans. That isn't always the case. Um, there's lots of Hispanic Americans here too. That's not always the case um, in other places. And even at UCR, we're, very, we're the most diverse of the UCs for undergrads. Grad students, the largest ethnicity among grad students is white. Think about the grad students in your lab. Um, and uh, think about your professors, right? So yes, UCR's undergraduate population is diverse, but if you are a member of minority community, that might be something you wanna talk about here because that still uh, it changes your interaction with the world, right? I have an Asian American friend who isn't going to the grocery store right now because she's tired of getting dirty looks, right? Um, people do not give me dirty looks. So her, she's facing an additional challenge simply because of her ethnicity. I only had one kind of question that we'll touch on and then just wrap up. Um, quickly then be able to take additional questions is things that um, maybe be particularly sensitive and do you want to disclose them or not? So some examples might be some type of abuse or assault that um, a student has experienced, whether that be physically, emotionally, mentally, sexually, um, or potentially a disability or some type of, it could be a disability, it could be like a mental health illness. Uh, any of those things are really up to you to determine um, if you want to disclose something so personal to the committee or not. You are under no obligation to report a sexual assault or um, a challenge with your own mental health or a physical or mental cognitive disability. Now, if you feel that that information would be helpful to the committee to better understand your experience, you feel that you've, um, re I don't know if recovered is the right word, but you feel like you've recovered um, at least to the point where you can speak about that experience without it, having like that PTSD um, emotional response, right? If, if you were to be discussing this in an interview and you had been sexually assaulted or had been um, dealing with a severe bout of a mental illness, depression or anxiety or something, and you just really weren't far, far enough removed from that experience to be able to talk about it without having an emotional response, then it might not be something that you would want to include in this essay. If it's something that um, you have a handle on, you've recovered from, you can speak about with some objectivity, and you feel it would be helpful for the committee to know that information to better understand who you are as a person, then it would absolutely be appropriate to share. Um, there are physicians and dentists that have experienced all of those things as well, because at the end of the day, they're people too. There are physicians that um, 
see their own psychiatrist. And, and I would probably say most physicians see a therapist or a psychiatrist because it's really hard to be a physician. You will see some really sad and um, large injustices within our society, and it's hard to carry that. So there are physicians that are on mental health medication. There are physicians in therapy. Um, there are physicians that have been assaulted. Um, there are black physicians that get harassed at the grocery store, right? There, there are unfortunately um, sad things that happen to all humans because that's kind of part of the, the lived experience of being a human. So it's not wrong to share your own lived experiences, but you do have to decide if it's something that you're ready to share if it's something that you're comfortable sharing and, and certainly not every aspect of our life is something that we want to put on paper for another human to read. So yeah. hopefully that kind of addresses the, the questions that I was getting um, in regards to maybe some more sensitive topics, but we could certainly discuss that more in private if you need. Yeah, and the disadvantage statement is completely optional. Um, you do not have to do it. Um, the reason Amber and I encourage it is, um, well, I don't want to speak for Amber. I sincerely believe a lot of those disadvantages are actually good things you guys are bringing to the table and will make you a better healthcare professional. And I want you to take that opportunity to be like, I am awesome. I speak three languages. Like, that's great. Um, <laughs> I know what it's like to struggle with mental health, if that's something you feel comfortable with, right? Um, but you, you do not have to do it. Um, I just... We encourage you guys because many of those experiences help make you the person you are today and they are valuable. Yep. Agreed. Um, so just in the interest of time, I wanna move on to secondary applications and then just some, some summary do's and don'ts here. So you would think between a personal statement and a special life circumstances essay and um, your extracurricular essays, and, and sometimes in dental you get a manual dexterity essay, you would think you would be done with your writing, but you won't be. Um, after you finish your primary application and, and all of the different writing sections of that application, you'll submit your app um, to the centralized service, and then an individual school will likely decide if they want to send you a secondary application or a supplemental application. Medical schools call it secondaries, dental schools call it supplementals. Um, and these are additional short essay questions that are now school specific. So as Jen mentioned in that personal statement, you're never going to really say, well, why do I want to go to UCR School of Medicine or why do I want to go to USC School of Dentistry? You're not going to answer that question in your personal statement but you very well may likely answer that question through a secondary or supplemental application. Um, they are usually essays. They're generally short essays, so a paragraph or so, maybe a long paragraph. Um, and this is an opportunity for you to expand on information from your primary application. You don't necessarily want to duplicate information during secondaries and supplemental applications. You may speak about the same experience again. You may kind of recycle a club or an org or a clinical experience. But when we say don't duplicate, we mean don't go into your primary application and just literally copy and paste the language that you used in your primary application into your supplemental application. You can use the same experience, the same Riverside Free Clinic or dental shadowing or um, FDC or, or something. You can use the same club or org, but you want to be able to frame that experience in a different way that it's answering the new question that you're being asked. Can I add something real quick with that? Yeah, just let me add to that. Um, oh. you're, we're not going to spend like a whole lot of time right now going through what to write in secondary applications, but we did post a secondary application workshop earlier in June, and it was recorded and it's posted on our HPAC YouTube channel. So if and when you get to the point where you're at secondary applications, there's a separate like one hour workshop um, hosted by two of my past students that go more in detail with that. So real quick with the duplication, some things you have to, like you're not gonna come up with another name for the Riverside Free Clinic, that's what it's called. 
But as Amber said, we don't want you to just copy and paste. Um, and often for big experiences, you can focus on more than one thing, right? So if you were an SI, for example, you could talk about the education, you could talk about the leadership, you could talk about public speaking, you could talk about um, explaining difficult concepts, right? So it can still all be within supplemental instruction, but you'll focus on different things in different places, right? Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. But yeah, the name of SI is supplemental instruction. It's not going to be additional teaching that is not done by the instructor of record. Like that's, it's called <laughs> supplemental instruction. <laughs> yeah. And, and so what Jen's referring to, um, sometimes we'll, we'll say like the lens at which you choose to evaluate your experience, right? Like if you're talking about being an SI leader in one essay, you might talk about, um, kind of meeting a student where they're at and identifying what that student's learning style is, kind of the idea of like individualized care, but maybe in a different essay, you focus on um, public speaking skills, right? And so you're taking the same experience, but you're evaluating it through a different lens. So you may hear um, some advisors use that term and, and that's how we're referring to it. Um, we want these submitted as quickly as possible, so they will come with deadlines. You could get a secondary application in August, and the deadline might be December. I beg of you, do not wait until the deadline because your application isn't going to move forward until you submit secondaries. So a general rule of thumb is about 10 to 14 days once you receive the secondary is when you'll want to submit it. Um, these are generally very specific questions and sometimes they'll start to get recycled through different schools. So we don't find students struggle with secondary and supplemental essays the way that you might um, feel uncomfortable with the personal statement. So this is kind of down the line that I'm talking about this, but by the time you get to secondary applications, you'll likely be a lot more comfortable with your writing and this probably will be um, easier than you may be thinking it is right now. It, it's probably not going to be too challenging. But if you do run into trouble, you have HPAC, you have my office, um, especially some of the secondaries are weird. So I like to joke, I don't know what normal ones look like. I only see the weird ones. Oh yeah, yeah. Because uh, if it's a, a quote unquote normal one, students usually feel like I know how to answer this. I don't need to ask for help. We might see one like, um, tell me, a sentence or tell me a statement that's not true that you wish was true and why um, which is one of the UC USC secondaries so that might be something that you say okay um, what should I write here and we'll say I don't know what's a sentence <laughs> which was true like I wish education was free that's what I saw a student write um, so you know we'll kind of deal with that when it comes just some do's and don'ts here. I'm not gonna necessarily go through all of these because you can read them. The one I wanna highlight is the one in red is to not have too many thoughts. And this goes back to something that I said earlier. You know, you can't put 25 years of life into 5,300 characters, including spaces. You really have to sit back and think about like, what are all of my reasons to be a dentist? Like, let's get an idea of what all of those are. Now we need to start to rank them. What are the most important to the least important of my 25 reasons? And then those most important reasons will likely be what flushes out into your personal statement. So you, you just can't, you can't say, oh, everything that Jen and Amber talked about today is the reason I want to go to medical school. And now I'm going to try to fit that into my essay. That's just not going to be feasible. Um, one of my sayings is, if you try to say too many things, at the end of the day, you say nothing at all, because you just have overloaded the reader and you haven't used your space to effectively build up and articulate your messaging. So you're really not going to have um, too many different thoughts going on in your personal statement. And there's actually, Jen, you want to highlight here? I do actually, because um, I've been seeing it recently, is people using the thesaurus kind of recklessly. Mm. Um, so that is very useful if you're like, man, I need another word. Oh, right, that word. But that's, that's, but what I see people do sometimes is uh, they don't realize that words mean slightly different things. So I had a student once who at the, wrote an essay about running the LA Marathon and at the end was like, I'm, I martyred myself. And I was like, 
you know what martyr means? And, oh, well, I just used the thesaurus. And I'm like, it means dying for the faith. Do you mean you died for the faith of marathon running? So uh, I've also had students write essays about the infamous Harriet Tubman as a role model um, because they don't realize what infamous means. So yes, that's useful, but make sure whatever word you're picking is a word you would actually use, yep. right? Because you're going to go into an interview and the language that you use and how you articulate yourself should be consistent with your writing in your application. And that's where having um, paid people assist you with your application or uh, lifting language from the internet can be really problematic because your writing may look one way, but your speaking style and the way you present yourself in person is going to look a different way. And that kind of inconsistency within the application is going to really cause the admissions committee to say, okay, but who is the person we're really admitting here? And if they don't have a good idea of who you actually are as a person, they might just go on to the next applicant. So there does need to be um, consistency between your verbal language and your written language. Yeah, and it, you do, this should be college level vocabulary. Um, but by that we mean you don't wanna say, I gotta be a doctor. Like that's not formal, right? Um, and like I said, this can be really useful if you're like, man, I need a different, a slightly different word for this. Um, that's good, but yeah, because I've actually seen quite a few this time around. I'm like, why did we pick this word? Thesaurus <laughs> told me to. So some do's here. Here's again a lot of do's. Um, let's see. The one I would like to highlight, I guess, would be consider writing the other areas of your application first. This is my 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 human speaking to you, not necessarily my advisor self, but like Amber as a human. And Amber as an undergraduate scientist, my undergraduate degrees in biology. Um, and so when I did my master's degree, I switched disciplines into educational policy and became uh, acutely aware of my writing deficiencies. Um, because, you know, as a biology major, you don't do a lot of writing. So I think it can be really difficult to just jump into the personal statement. And I think some of these other areas can help reinvigorate those skill sets. It's like if you wanted to run a marathon, you wouldn't just go out and run 26.7 miles. You would probably start with a 5k. So uh, start with those sections would be the one I want to highlight from this list and, and Jennifer may have some as well. Uh, proofread, proofread a lot. Proofread until you, you're sick of it. Um, because there are also things, when you move stuff around, sometimes you end up with what I like to call revision artifacts, where you have a random bonus period somewhere. So proofread. Read it out loud. Read it out loud to somebody else. That's what um, I was going to say. Read it out loud. I like that. Especially native speakers, that's the easiest way for us to proofread, because we can hear stuff. We don't always know what's wrong. We just know something's wrong. If you read it out loud to somebody else, it slows you down even more, and you're like, wait, 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 I have two, the same word twice here. Um, Bribe your roommate with a cookie. Be like, eat this cookie while I read my essay to you. Um, yeah, because so. it cannot be edited once it's been submitted. Um, and theoretically, you've had a few months to work on this essay. So submitting an essay you've had considerable time to polish with errors does not make a medical school very confident that you can um, make notes, charting notes for a patient in you know eight minutes without making a mistake. And, and obviously a mistake in a patient record could lead to a very serious outcome for that patient. So um, we do need that to be polished and, and error-free and it cannot be edited once submitted. So my recommendation would be to have three reviewers um, one reviewer who is really good at writing English grammar syntax that could be Jennifer or her staff. It could be just somebody in your network. Lawyers make incredible editors because um, English and writing is a very strong skill set for lawyers, so they make awesome editors. Somebody who knows the purpose of this essay, um, an advisor like myself, an HPAC, maybe a physician or somebody on an admissions committee, somebody who kind of knows like what should be included, what is a quote unquote good personal statement. 
And then somebody who knows you well, somebody who can read your essay and say, yep, Johnny, this reads like Johnny wrote it, or Sally, this reads like Sally wrote it. When they read your essay, they should almost like hear your voice in their head. Um, those would, I think, be three great reviewers. If you start to get five, six, seven, eight, ten people looking at your personal statement, you're going to get a lot of conflicting feedback that may drive you a little bonkers. So my recommendation would be no more than three reviewers to a personal statement. And then lastly, I'm just going to leave this up um, as some additional resources in case you feel at the end of this you still need some additional help. There's unlimited blogs and podcasts and um, forums. Please be very careful with the source of the information that you are listening to and when you start to hear really extreme things like it should be a creative writing essay or you need to use really specific examples if something seems kind of really far on the, the extreme end of the spectrum, perhaps that might not be the best advice. So you really have to look at like who's sharing this information, what is their expertise, what is their purpose, um, because there's a lot of information out there on the internet and so you really have to have that ability to sort and filter what is good information and maybe what's bad information. So these would be some that we would recommend at this point. Lastly, um, we'll move on to taking questions here, but in HPAC, the Health Professions Advising Center, we work with both current students and alumni but the writing support program in the ARC can only work with current students or very recent alumni, meaning like to the end of June, if you just graduated on June 15th. Um, so think about using those resources as appropriate as well.